All right, so the sermon title is Dogs and Pigs in the Church. Dogs and Pigs in the Church. <clears throat> Turn in your Bibles to Second Peter chapter number 2. I will tell you that this is a biblical text that would never be preached if you're just doing topical messages. You would not want to tackle this. This is a hard text. Let's begin at verse number one. There were false prophets also among the people, as there shall be false teachers among you who privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of, and through covetousness they shall, shall they with feigned or fake or ungenuine words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and if God spared not the old world but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness bringing into the world the flood, uh, upon the world the flood of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that afterward should live ungodly lives. And if delivered and, and delivered Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds... The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations or trials and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, Bring not railing accusation against them, but before the Lord. But these are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of the things they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Shall receive the reward of unrighteous and they that count it pleasure to riot in daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery... And that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. They've forsaken the way, the right way, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wage of righteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. Now look at verse 17. 16 verses to lead to 17. These, referring to the false teachers, are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist or blackness of darkness is reserved forever. Why? For when they speak... Great swelling words of vanity, they allure or entice through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness or debauchery, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. Verse 19 While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. Now verse 20. 
For if after they escape the pollution of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. Notice, please. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they'd known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. The pig that was washed to wallowing in the mire. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning to engage ourselves in the seriousness of the text. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to grasp the degree to which Peter is insistent upon you getting the seriousness of his entire message by this culminating proverb, this culminating proverb, this incredibly gross thing that he leaves in your mind as he brings his argument down to an end. He's like a district attorney before a grand jury and he's arguing his case and arguing his case and making his case and then he gets to the culminating point. The last thing he wants to leave you with is a dog returning to eat its vomit. Now, I grew up with dogs. We had lots of dogs. Every place we lived, we had dogs, dogs, and more dogs. And dogs will eat their vomit in a minute. And it is just utterly disgusting to see a dog belch something up and then turn around and eat what they just belched up. It is a gross picture. It is not intended to be pleasant. It doesn't get you ready for lunch at wherever you're going. It's nasty. And if that wasn't enough, he then turns and says, maybe you didn't get the picture, so let me give you another one. So he gives us a picture of a sow, a big old fat pig, all cleaned up. And just the moment you get that thing clean and let it go, Back to the mud it goes. Back to the mud. You think I just got you cleaned and it's wallowing in the mud. That's the closing argument that he brings to us to show us how serious he is about making his point about two groups of people. The false teachers who have infiltrated the church and the new individual in the church that's being deceived by the false teacher. Two individuals will be back and forth all morning long on them. These, referring to the false teachers, are like wells without water. They're like a Gatorade jug that's empty. You've had an amazingly hard practice. You're exhausted. You go over to the bench, you mash the button, and nothing comes out. And you realize this jug is empty and I will not have my thirst quenched from it. But of course we're not talking about water and Gatorade jugs this morning. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that the false teachers do not quench your thirst. The message that they bring every Sunday from their pulpits all over the world. The message that they deliver through their podcast. The messages that they beam through the internet. Those messages, while they sound awesome, while they look like a beautiful Gatorade jug, while you think, wow, it's going to be great once I get over there. Once you get into it, you realize this doesn't truly satisfy my soul. And the reason it won't satisfy your soul is because each and every one of us inside know we're sinners in need of redemption. We're sinners in need of a Savior. We need someone to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the message these false teachers deliver doesn't contain that focus. And so Peter goes running all the way back to Jeremiah 
where Jeremiah says, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They've hewed out cisterns or holding tanks like this one right here. And what you're expecting is there should be water inside there. And when you get there, there's no water to satisfy your soul. So what are we talking about? What is the application? Any sermon delivered in which Christ is not the focus and the gospel is not there is like a Gatorade jug empty. An empty Gatorade jug. It doesn't contain the living water. John 4, whosoever drinks of the water, Jesus told that woman at the well, that I shall give him shall never, church, shall never, say it loud please, thirst, never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What are we talking about? The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the single greatest demonstration of mercy, compassion, generosity, self-denial, perfect obedience to the will of God, sacrificial, unconditional love in the history of humanity. Now that's a sentence. So we're not going to just run over that. Let's see what we're talking about here. Mercy, compassion, generosity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus denied himself. How did Jesus deny himself? He left the glories of heaven where he was and seated and adored and all that to come to earth, to take on human flesh, to get diarrhea, to be dehydrated, to get headaches, to be this and that and go through every single thing that a human being goes through in order to get to a cross in order to die on a cross. He denied himself. We're talking about perfect obedience to the will of the Father. Not my will, but church, thine be done. We're talking about unconditional love for humanity. We read earlier in Peter that Christ died or bought or secured potential redemption for those that he knew would spit in his face. It's one thing for a husband to die for his wife. In fact, we expect you to die for your wife. In fact, we question whether you're a man if you're not willing to die for your wife. But it's a whole nother thing to die for someone that you know hates your guts. And so what are you saying this morning? I'm saying that these values, qualities, characteristics, attributes are the filter that you run the sermon through if you're trying to decide is it a gospel-centered sermon or not. And so you take a 45-minute sermon that you heard from a potential false teacher and you say, did it have emphasis on generosity? Did it have emphasis on being obedient to the will of the Father? Did you see an encouragement to be merciful, tender, compassionate, gracious? Were you encouraged to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus Christ? Were you encouraged to love your brother as yourself or as your neighbor as yourself? Were you encouraged to love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and being? And if the answer is no, 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 then you say that message is like a Gatorade jug empty because what we're looking for this morning is not to feed the lust of the flesh we're looking for encouragement this morning to be more like Jesus and the values and the attributes of Jesus are more closely seen in the gospel than anywhere else And so what Peter is saying to us this morning is that each one of us need to learn to have discerning ears. And we need to listen to the teacher, whatever it is. I won't call names this morning, but you fill in the favorite false teacher out there. And you say, was I encouraged this morning to obey the will of the Father? Was I encouraged to be compassionate? Did I see in here a generosity, a spirit of generosity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? If the answer is no, potentially, Potential false teacher. You see, messages that do not promote these values and characteristics are not Christ-centered and therefore absent of the living water. 
And so Peter says to these, these, notice verse 17, please, these are wells without water. They are clouds that are carried about with the tempest. They go here, they go here, they go here. They just move about to whom the mist of darkness is reserved. If you have an ESV in your lap, it's going to say the word blackness. And that's a great translation because in Jude 13, the King James translators translate the exact same Greek word blackness. So the blackness of darkness. What are we talking about? What in the world do we need to say? The blackness of darkness. Jude's point in Jude 13, Peter's point here is that God has reserved a special place in hell for those who deceive others. That's how serious it is. It's already dark. It's the blackness of dark. The remote corner The idea would be it's already dark in there, but the further you get in here, it's getting darker and darker and darker. Can you imagine that kind of scenario in your mind? Hey, hey, God's in charge of hell. That's right. Your placement in hell is determined by God. You ever heard some stupid soldier say something like, when I get to hell, I'll be in charge? No, you won't. God's sovereignty extends to every inch and every corner of the entire universe. And God is in charge of the location of your judgment in hell. You say, where are you getting that from? I'm getting it from is to is reserved the utter darkness of them forever. What a scary thought. This is serious business. He is making a significant point here. Jesus talks about outer darkness three different times in Matthew 8, Matthew 22, and Matthew 25. Peter's talking about hell here. The hell in which he said that the angels are delivered to and reserved in chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. God has a special place in hell for those who lead people astray? The answer is yes. That's why James 3 says, not many of you should become teachers. You decide, I'll I'll teach. That's a very serious calling. I'll teach. I'll speak on behalf of God this morning. I'll take the people of God into a classroom, and I'll tell them, thus saith the Lord. Peter says, that's a serious calling right there. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who should teach should be judged with greater strictness. You better look at the Bible one more time. Make sure you get it right. Study the context. Make sure you're teaching what is true. Why? Because you will be held to a greater degree of accountability. This is what the whole point of verse 15 and 16 was with Balaam as as an example right here. He says, they've forsaken the right way. They've gone astray. They've followed the way of Balaam who loved money He was rebuked for this sin. In fact, it took a dumb ass speaking to him with a man's voice to stop his madness. And to that individual, Peter compares the false teachers of the year 2015. Let's look at verse number 18, please. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. We've got one group, and they're called those that live in error. Then we've got another one that looks like they've escaped right there. And then we've got a group that allures them. So we've got false teachers who allure a group of individuals, not the ones that are living in error, but the ones that were clean escaped from them. Three individuals right there are three groups in that. The false teachers, those that they're enticing with words, and those that live in error. We're talking about the ones that they entice with words. Let me show it to you in a couple of translations to see if I can unpack it. For these false teachers speaking loud boast of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Or let's look at another one there. For by high speaking sounding but empty words, they are able to entice with fleshly desires and with debauchery people who have just escaped from those who reside in error. What are you saying? The message of the false preacher or false teacher appeals to the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. That's what it does. It appeals to them. 
Well, think about what you know about the prosperity gospel of the 21st century. Is there any other teaching that appeals to the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the eyes that you see? It says, if you do this, God will give you this. It's appealing to materialism. It's appealing to the possession of physical things. The prosperity gospel appeals to the pride of life and the accumulation of possessions. The prosperity gospel flies in the face of self-denial. Nobody ever hears on Sunday morning from that Houston place, take up your cross and follow Jesus. They wouldn't even know what a cross looks like. There's none in the dome. Not one. In the whole place. How do you have a church and not have a cross? I don't understand that. It appeals to the lust of the flesh. It puts the well-being of man at the center of the gospel. It trivializes the suffering of Christ. Christ didn't die on a cross so you could drive a Mercedes Benz. God didn't leave the glories of heaven so that you could have granite countertops. You want granite countertops? Go to work. Go to work. Save up your money and pay for them yourself. You don't need to send any seed money to preach your X, Y, and Z and hope and get in the money that you need. You'd be better off. I was going to say buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Second Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. We're there. We're there. Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina is the home of Bob Jones University. It is the buckle of the Bible Belt. More churches in Greenville, South Carolina than any other city in the United States per capita. First Baptist Church, Greenville, South Carolina, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, voted. First Baptist Church. Say, what's the big deal about First Baptist Church? First Baptist Church, Greenville, South Carolina, was the very first church church, its pastor was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the very first president of the Southern Baptist Convention in the 1800s. I'm talking about, that was before they were independent fundamental Baptists. That's when Southern Baptists were the independent fundamental Baptists. That's when there was no question as to what conservatism was. It was found in First Baptist Church, Greenville, South Carolina, first president of the convention. Three weeks ago, they voted to ordain transgender clergy. I did not say a Methodist church. I did not say Episcopalian church. I didn't say a Lutheran church. I said First Baptist Church, Greenville, South Carolina. I didn't say Vermont, where all the liberals are. That's not what I said. I said South Carolina. South Carolina. So don't you think that we're exempt from the days in which they shall after their own lust heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I decided that the sermon was with my attention, so I went to their website, looked at the sermon. It was 15 minutes and 30 seconds long. That was the Sunday morning sermon. You can't even get an introduction in 15 minutes. That was the entire sermon. There was not one single reference to a book, chapter, or verse of the Bible in 16 minutes. Not one. Seriously. He mentioned truth and said it's in the New Testament, it's in the Old Testament. I'm talking about quoting scripture like 1 Samuel chapter 7 so that people would be expected to look it up in their own Bibles. Not one single mention. For the time will come when they will endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they'll heap themselves teachers having itching ears. And the church is here, folks. So verse 19 says, while they promise liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption of whom a man is overcome, the same as he brought into redemption. Jesus said it like this. He said, you can't serve two masters. You cannot serve two masters. You love the one and hate the other. You better figure out what servant you're going to serve, what, uh, who you're going to serve. In the prosperity gospel, liberty is found in dollars, not in Christ. Here's the message. If you just get to that income level, you'll be happy. You know what happens? You get there, and you're not satisfied. So you know what you need? A new level. And when you get there, you won't be satisfied either. In fact, there'll never be enough money to satisfy you. 
Christ is where your true satisfaction will be found. But you can't find Christ in those churches. He is absent. They kicked him out a long time ago. So what are you enslaved to? I mean, I am growing to understand that we have people sitting here that are living double lives. Two weeks ago, I was made aware of the fact that we had a church member here several years ago that was living a double life. What are you talking about living a double life? He would come into services with his Bible, go to Sunday school, work in our ministry the entire time. He was carrying on multiple affairs for four years. So let's not be stupid this morning or naive. There's probably someone here sitting here doing the same thing. Are you enslaved to materialism or is it tobacco or profanity or alcohol or pornography? What are you enslaved to? Human worship? What do you mean enslaved to human worship? That's where you have to be the center of attention at all times. I've already begun to see this in middle school. I'm, I'm teaching middle school this year as well. That you're the kid that everyone's always got to be around giving you adoration. And you're not satisfied if you're not the center of attention. You've got to always be after the center of attention. Christ can't be the center. You have to be the center. Watch it, brothers, Ed. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about, and you'll see the kids that are addicted to self-worship. Verse 20. For after, the, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at it in your Bible, because I, I should have finished it. I want you to see the argument that he's presenting here. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. We're not talking about the false prophets anymore, the false teachers. That, those group, that group is already reserved to the outer darkness. That's not the group that we're having a conversation about. What we're having a conversation about is the them. Look at verse 19. You've got to follow the pronouns or you can't understand your Bible. While they, the false prophets or teachers, promise them. Who are the them? Who is the them? Look at, look, look at the previous verse. They were clean escape from them who live in error. They themselves are servants of the corruption, the false teachers from whom a man is overcome, the same as he brought into bondage. For if after they escape the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Verse 21 shows you how serious it is. He says, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they'd known it to forsake it. Now, this is, this is a difficult passage. This is not an easy passage. Our free will Baptist brothers in Christ, I'm calling them brothers in Christ. I'm calling them brothers in Christ because they worship the exact same God we do. They are straight on who Jesus is. They believe in the gospel just like we do. If you ask them, how does a man get saved? They'll say faith in Christ and Christ alone. Those free will Baptists, John, they interpret this different than we do. And let me just tell you right now, it's not heresy. You know what they're trying to do? Be true to the scriptures. What are we trying to do this morning? We're trying to be true to the scriptures too. They're trying to understand what is this all about? Because this says right here, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, that sounds a lot like a person saved. I know you're saying that right away, Dave. I got it. You're trying to cut me off. But I'm just trying to look at this language and see how much it sounds like saved. I just want us to pause for a minute here and absorb the text. I don't want to just run through it so fast. Once saved, I always say, move on, brother. Because it says right there, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me see if I can describe a scenario for you for just a minute and see if we can follow along. He says, the preacher lost his faith in eternal security of the believer. No, I haven't. But I do want to be faithful to the Bible text. Is that okay? 
Imagine for just a moment a soldier who's never grown up in church in his entire life. Dave, like your life, divorced parents, and somebody gives him an invite, come to church. Davy shows up at Brigham Baptist Church, and people are welcoming, they're encouraging, they're friendly. He gets an invite to Sunday school. He gets an invite to the Tuesday night Bible study where Adam is. He's never been around Christians before. These people are unique. They do not smoke for the most part. There may be an occasional one, but for the most part. They drink in moderation or don't drink at all. There's a significant absence of the F word and profanity is very rare. There seems to be a level of respect for females. It's not a piece of meat that you're after. Women dress for the most part modestly. And he says to himself, this is a unique group. And he finds himself appealing to the group because he's already had the world dick. And he hasn't found any satisfaction in the world. He knows he's got a hunger and thirst for the things of God because God created him with eternity in his heart. Can I get an amen? Amen. So he starts hanging out with the church. And he begins to realize that I've got to look different and act different because these people are different. So he begins to bring himself under a certain amount of religious or moral reform. Now he's taking in Christ. He's processing sermons. And in order to be accepted in the group, he stops using this. And can you all see what I'm saying? He conforms. Very good. He's aware of the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ because he hears preaching of God's word. From the outside, it sure does look like he's beginning to escape the pollutions of the world. His language is cleaned up. It's been weeks since he's seen pornography. He told that girl he could stop sleeping with her because he's different. I think he might fit that category. Do you know you don't have to be saved in order to reform your life? I didn't say redeem, I said reform. You can bring moral reform into your life. Have you ever met a Mormon before? They are some of the most righteous people on the planet. And they're not saved. But they'll talk about the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you look at them and they've absolutely escaped the pollutions of the world. Now this is what he says here. He said, if that person on that, can I use the word edge? Edge, John. You see how I'm using that word edge? He hasn't been redeemed yet. He hasn't been born again yet. But it sure looks like he's escaped the moral pollutions of this world. If at that point he's listening to a podcast on the internet and speaker X or Y comes up and boy, those high sounding words sure do sound enticing. The power of positive thinking. Get a hold of this and move forward. Send this ministry. And suddenly someone who is on the edge of conversion. Right there. Just right there, folks. Certain amount of moral reform going on, hearing the words of Christ, beginning to understand the gospel. Then suddenly he's drug away by the false prophet into a false religion way over here, church, with enticing words and corruption and debauchery. But he thinks he's in Christ because of the enticing words that are used, the debauchery, the sensual, the appeals to the lust. What does Peter say about that person? It would have better for them not to have known the truth than to have known righteousness and abandon it. You say, what is the difference between what you're saying and what a free will Baptist would say? The free will Baptist would say they were born again and went into apostasy. Now listen to me very closely. I don't want to misrepresent them. They do not deny the sufficiency of Christ's work, Dave. They do not say that what he did wasn't sufficient. They say that God gives us the will to apostatize. We would disagree with that. We would say that this person was not converted. But from an outward perspective, church, it looks much like they are converted. And from our looking, like Peter's looking, it looks like they've escaped the world. It looks like they've got the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Because here's the reality, church. You and I don't know if they're born again. We don't know if the moral reform that they're experiencing is self-reform or is it the grace of God working in their life. It's impossible sometimes to draw a line between the two. And Peter, in my opinion, is addressing, and the reason I said my opinion is because I respect their diligence to be faithful to the biblical text. Because the heart of their goal is to make sure they're not giving false assurance of salvation to people who are not saved. Is it possible to participate in enough moral and religious reform to begin feeling like you've escaped the pollutions of the world and not be saved? You say, could you give us a case in point? Yes, I will. I want you to think about an exchange student that you receive at a Christian school, Dick, uh, Dick, uh, Don, Dave, and they've never experienced God. And suddenly you throw them into chapel, church, Bible, seven days of work. Their whole world begins to change. Mm -hmm. And from the outside, it sure does look like Johnny got saved. It sure does look like Joe got saved. They go to camp. They come to chapel. They're at youth group. But let's face it, folks. We don't know. We don't know. If they are again entangled therein and overcome, I think this is almost identical to the soils. I think it's almost identical to the third soil. Bill, I have no idea why you're sitting over there, but please don't sit there anymore, okay? I need you to sit right here. (laughs) This is so throwing me off, okay? I'm like out of my comfort zone. This is kind of where you sit right here. Those of you all that are sitting in Bill's spot next week, you don't sit here, okay? (laughs) All right, I'll just tell you that right now. This is where he sits. Nick, you'll be back. The Sturm family sits right around here. Okay? You want to sit there? Tithe more. Okay? Okay? Visitors, that was just a joke, okay? That was just a joke. Mark 4. Soil types. Would you look at this one? And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke them. Now, I want you to think about the message of the prosperity gospel and see if it's not appealing to that right there. What are you doing? I am comparing that right there to what he says in verse number 18. See if you can follow me. For when they speak of great swelling words of vanity, they allure or entice through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. You see, when you put that seed in the ground, church, and you wait that thing to sprout out, and you got another one over here, in the beginning when they're both like this, you don't know which one's going to produce fruit or not. And they look almost identical. And it's only until you see some flowers that you know, oh, it's going to produce some fruit. In the beginning, it's very difficult to tell. It's very difficult to tell. He says the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Could the latter end be loss of rewards? There's no way the latter end could be loss of rewards because the former is worse than the latter and the former is hell. So it cannot be loss of rewards. He says, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they'd known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. What does Peter mean by known the way of righteousness? Is he talking about saved or not saved and lost? How should I understand these words like tasted, known, believed, escaped, turned from? I'm talking about Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, church. Tough passages. We should not let, once saved, always saved, blow right through them. Free will Baptists and Pentecostals interpret these words differently. And I respect the degree to which they're trying to be faithful to the Scripture. 
Does Peter mean known in an intellectual awareness sense or does Peter mean known in a salvific way? I can't call Peter up and ask him, but I'm going to run to Paul for some help. 1 Corinthians 15, look it on the screen with me. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you and which also you received and wherein you stand. Now I want you to see in the verse 1, there is a past tense there and there is a present tense right there. Do you see the past tense? Wherein also you did what, church? Received. There's the past tense. Do you see the present tense in the verse? You're standing on it right there. So I, in, in the past, received the gospel to be true. And how am I characterized? I am presently standing on the gospel. This is what I believe. This is my present truth. I believe that Jesus left the glories of heaven. He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, buried and rose again on the third day, ascended to be on the Father and right hand, and mediating for my sins and coming again to get me. And this is what I believe right now. Past, present. Now, can I get some help for the future? Verse 2. By which also you are saved. If, because it's in your Bible, folks. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you. What's if you keep in memory? It's future. Uh, keep in memory, like, don't forget the eggs and the milk. No, no, no. Let's look at the ESV rendering. Hold fast. Hold fast. Oh, now I'm getting it. I received Jesus. I am presently standing on this gospel truth, and I will not let go of this truth until you call me home. That's where eternal security is found. It's not found in a prayer you prayed in vacation Bible school. That will leave you so empty. You'll wake up at two o'clock in the morning wondering, did I pray the right prayer? What you need to do is hold on to the faith once delivered and don't you let it go. Paul said, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and don't you be moved away from the hope of the gospel. So here's my words. See if they're acceptable to you. The distinguishing quality of a true, authentic, genuine person who has been born again into the family of God is that they do hold fast to the gospel throughout the days of their life in spite of the cares of this world, in spite of tribulation, in spite of persecution or any other such peril. Can I get amen? amen? That's where assurance of salvation is found. And the reason they hold fast is because God's grace is sufficient and that grace holds them firm until the end. To God be the glory for his grace. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. But God's grace saved me, is saving me, and will keep me saved. Such that he gets all the glory. Every bit of the glory. But when you look at me, I am characterized by holding fast in the gospel. Now, do we have moments in which we struggle? You better believe we do. Back when I was a soldier here, a young soldier here, many years ago, the man in charge of our military ministry was the, a guy by the name of Dave Fernia. Dave Fernia was a retired command sergeant major from the Special Forces. He was a man's man. He's the kind of guy that you just want to spend time with. He's the, all the tabs, guys, all of them, whole left side, every badge going. If he had ECU, what are you all wearing now? ACUs, BCUs, what are you wearing now? I can't keep up with DCUs. What are you all wearing? Somebody knows what you're wearing. Throw me an acronym, please. Multi what? Multicams? Oh, my goodness. An army uniform. I can't keep up with the acronyms. He'd have them all stacked up right here, brother. He'd probably have a, one of those badges back here. That's how many he had. 
He was a Christian. As a young married man, he lost his boy to a drowning accident. He spent 20 years of his life blaming God for that drowning accident. In the middle of that, he looked like the devil, act like the devil by his own confession of faith, smoked like the best of them, cursed like the best of them, chased women like the best of them. But you know what happened? God's grace held him firm. And he came back to Christ and his church in a big way. My point is not we must live perfectly obedient lives in order to be saved. My point is that God's grace keeps us in the faith. And sometimes our lives look like a roller coaster ride at Carowinds. But in the end, the train lands in heaven. And this if stuff is not unique to Paul because Jesus said, if you love one another, you're my disciples. And if you keep my commandments. And so I'm not surprised that in 21 he says that they turn from the holy commandments. I'm not surprised about that because Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever can you. And Jesus said, you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And we're not surprised about this because we were together in chapter one where we read, therefore the brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things. We're not surprised about this language. We've seen it before. A assurance of salvation or eternal security is found in continuing in the faith once delivered. Can I tell you this morning, rock your world, that the phrase once saved, always saved is not found in your Bibles? It's not there. And I'm going to submit to you this morning, it is potentially misleading It is potentially misleading. I didn't say it was misleading. Listen to me very closely. I'm intentionally using the word potentially misleading. Because the reality is if you are authentically, genuinely, truly born again, then you are once saved, always saved. But here's the reality, Dan. I can't walk up to you and say, well, congratulations, brother. Good job. You're now saved. And let me just tell you, once saved, always saved. Because, Dave, you don't know if they're saved or not. Well, how would I know if they're saved? You'd have to take a trip up to heaven and check out the Lamb's Book of Life. I went there, I saw it. There are no words that you can tell someone to say in order to be saved. There are no words. There's no magic words that lock it in, set it straight. What you can tell them is Christians believe in the gospel. That's what you can tell them. They are characterized by believing. They are presently believing. And they continue to believe. And the assurance of salvation is not found in an action done in the past, but a present state of faith in the gospel. And that faith continues because God's grace is sufficient. And he does sustain his own. Because they're his. My sheep hear my And I know them. But we don't. That's the problem with once saved, always saved. You don't want to give someone false assurance of salvation. You say, why not? Do you have any idea how difficult it is to get someone to see they may be lost once you've given them false assurance of their salvation? It's like a dog who returns to his vomit. It's like a pig that was clean and goes back to the mud. You know this verse. This verse is often quoted to give eternal security. It says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So this is how the argument goes. Do you believe in the name of the Son of God? Yes, I do. Well, then according to this verse, you have eternal life. But that's not what John said. John said, these things have I written unto you. Where do I find these things? Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and the beginning of chapter number 5. 
So we did an entire sermon on these things. You can check it out this week on the web. 12 things that you can find in 1 John to check out your salvation. Balaam, that's our example from last week. You know what he said? He said, the Lord my God. Balaam said, the Lord my God. How about this character right here? Do you think that Judas Iscariot believed that Jesus was the Christ? Well, in what sense do you mean by that? Like Peter in Matthew 16? Well, no, I don't believe he was born again. But do you think that he thought that Jesus was something? You better believe he thought Jesus was something because he hung out with him for three and a half years. Consider what Jesus said in Matthew 7. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God, but he that does the will of my Father. So why are you so passionate about this? Here's my concern. Do you understand the number of students that come into our ministry, either through Sunday School, Awana, or Brian Baptist Academy, that know these things in an intellectual sense, but haven't appropriated them in a salvific way? What would it look like to come to Brian Baptist Academy in kindergarten and stay here for 13 years of education? How many chapel messages would you sit through? How many Bible lessons would you go through? How much accountability would you be creating? I'll show you how much accountability. It's like this. Chapel every single Monday, Bible, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday school, Sunday morning, worship service on Sunday night. And then you turn from the commandments. Then you walk away from the truth. Wouldn't you say that it looks like that person had known the way of righteousness? And this is what Peter says. It had been better for them not to have known any of it than to have known it and turn from the truth. What, what's going on here? I'm just about done. Give me one more minute. Just give me one minute. God is a just God. And the degree of punishment is based on the degree of accountability that you have. To whom much is given, much is required. You are not going to put a boy born in Afghanistan to a tribal family in the same level of accountability to a kid who was educated for 13 years in a Christian school. They are not under the same accountability. If they were, you would say there's nothing just about that. And our God is a just God. So with all that you know, if you walk away from this faith, the latter end is worse for you than if you'd never known the way of Christ. Let's pray.